Hello and welcome to episode number 27 of Rally Point. Welcome, we're back, we've survived, we're here for you and we've got big news. Massive news, huge announcement on this show about Total War Attila. Absolutely, but before that we've been busy. We have been absolutely up to our orcs in it. Yeah, that's, that's like a subtle reference to Total War Warhammer which we announced, right? <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. No, you can, that's, we've announced it. We can talk about it, everyone can talk about it. No, I, I couldn't, I could I can't, I can't comment! Right, okay, let's move on. Um, we had we had another big event um, at the ESL Studios in Cologne. Yeah, it was huge in Germany, uh, your homeland of course. Did you, did you see it? Y yes, I was there. I was physically there, I was, it, it was great. Cool. It was pretty um, awesome. We had loads of, <laughs> loads of YouTubers from all over the world um, playing a 10v10 Yeah, some of the setup. biggest stars, Jesse Cox. Um, yeah. You can check it out for yourself right now by clicking on Matt's face. Yeah, here. On my face. So Matt, tell us all about this, this new bit of content, which I believe is a campaign pack that we're announcing today. Exactly, it's a campaign pack. It's called The Last Roman, campaign pack for Total War Tiller, and it's based on the expedition that uh, the Emperor Justinian sent out to reconquer the old territories of the Western Roman Empire, and it was led by... Belisarius. Yes, Flavius Flavor Flav. <laughs> Flavius Flavor Flav. Belisarius, yeah. Um, and this is a huge campaign map. There are five playable factions in it. There's new mechanics, um, but we thought rather than us rabble on about it for however long, we would hand over to Mr. Jack Lusted, the Mercurial, Lord of the Sword himself, to tell us more about this campaign pack. Hit the road, Jack. The Last Roman is a brand new campaign pack focusing on the conquests of the great General Belisarius. 150 years after the start of the Attila Grand Campaign, the world looks very different. The Western Roman Empire has fallen and the Emperor Justinian, who still commands the Empire in the East, has sent his great General Belisarius out to defeat the Vandalic Kingdom in North Africa. Historically, he went on to conquer North Africa and Italy and greatly expanded the Empire's borders, coming as close as possible to reforming the Roman Empire of old. The campaign map is massive. I mean, if you're comparing it to the size of the Attila Grand Campaign map, it is almost as large, but focused just on Africa, Spain, Italy, and France. I mean, it gives great room for manoeuvre, and there's a lot of detail in the map itself. Going for this scale of map allows us to really focus on the geographic differences. I mean, you get a real exaggeration between like the plains of France and the Alps, and you, it's great watching you move the camera through the map and watching you follow the height of the terrain. It just really gets you immersed in the world. The title really says it all. This is The Last Roman. It was a title given to Belisarius himself, but also the Emperor Justinian who ordered him. It really marks the end point of the Roman era and the start of the medieval. After this point, the Roman Empire in the East gets talked about as the Byzantines by historians. It's something very different. This is the last real role of the Roman Empire, the last chance which really emerged as it was before, that great empire that covered all of Europe. Belisarius' faction works as an expedition, which is like the Horde in the Grand Campaign, but with several key differences. The main one being that when you take a region, you can reclaim it for the Roman Empire. And so without having to capture it yourself or own it, you can expand the borders of the Roman Empire and claim glory for the Emperor. But you also have the chance to settle down yourself, break off, declare yourself a kingdom, and work towards your own glory and goals. Bit ahistorical, but we love giving players that choice. Our campaign this focus also allows us to go into a lot of depth on character. There's a whole bunch of events around Belisarius himself, because there's really three people who influenced him. The Emperor Justinian, the Empress and his wife. And you'll get different missions and objectives from each of them, and you've got to try and balance what risks and rewards you want to take. And these will play out throughout the campaign and help give a much more personal feel to it. The time period covered by the campaign I mean, we're going 12 turns a year here, so it's really very detailed. You're getting a long lifespan for characters. There's several big natural disasters that happen that really change stuff. There's first, like, there was a super volcano that was detonated over near Indonesia that caused the chaos. You know, no one in Europe knew about this. Indonesia's far, far away. But the skies blackened, crops failed, and this event will hit hard in the campaign and cause severe weather changes that will lessen over time, but it's still something that you've got to watch out for and really gives an atmospheric look to the campaign. And then alongside that, if you know, super volcanoes detonating wasn't enough, we've got the Plague of Justinian, a plague so massive it devastated populations throughout the Mediterranean. 
I mean, millions of people died. It's really not a good time to be alive for most people. We've also added a new option in diplomacy for this, which is open to the expedition once you reach certain conditions, but is available to all the other playable factions as well. Many factions in this time period took over the old institutions of empire, you know. The Western Roman Empire might be dead, but it's not quite gone yet. And there's a possibility in the game that you can convince other factions to join you and you will form the Western Roman Empire yourselves. Your faction name will change, you'll absorb their armies and their territory, and you can expand that way. So you can do it via either conquest or diplomacy. There are certain conditions that need to be met, but you'll find them as you play. So alongside this massive campaign pack is coming free OC content that you'll hear about later, and a patch for the main Attila game, which will feature bug fixing and banners changes to the whole game itself. Hope you all enjoy it. Thank you, Jack. And The Last Roman will be out on June the 25th. Yes, and the 25th of June is also the day that we will be celebrating 15 years of Total War. It's our birthday! Way! Yes, June 25th is the day itself. You know, that <laughs> You'll have seen, we've been celebrating for, yeah. well, most of the year, to be honest. We had a big giveaway at Res earlier in the year for our 15 years. Yeah. And, um, and a great trailer for 15 years of Total War. That yeah, was awesome check well. that out online. Um, but 25th of June is the day itself where we'll be having the main extravaganza. Mark it down in your calendar, not just because of that, but also because you can get, finally, Medieval and Shogun, the originals, on Steam for the first time. Yes, finally completing my Steam catalog. Get in. Get, yes. Get right in. And we thought we would sit down with the godfather of those early games and still, in fact, Mr. Mike Simpson, the creative director here at the studio, to reminisce about those fantastic titles. Yeah, it's interesting the way Shogun came about. Uh, um, when I joined Creative Assembly, there were only five people here, and they'd, they'd been working on um, sports games for Electronic Arts, uh, conversions onto PC of things like Australian Rules Football, that's what they were working on at the time. And uh, when I joined, we were intending to uh, expand the studio out, to set up another team, with, uh, and the idea was we were going to do an RPG based on Monkey, uh, the journey to the East thing. Um, and we, we were actually thinking about setting up a, a sister studio in Singapore to do it. And um, we looked into all that and like most things that seemed too good to be true at the time, there were lots of incentives to do it. They were too good to be true and it turned out that staying in the UK and doing it was a better idea. So we stayed in Horsham. Um, but the idea, of, the idea of doing the RPG based on Monkey, um, we, did, we did a few prototypes on that and, and um, it was all looking quite positive, but it was quite a tough route to go down. Making an RPG is not an easy thing. Um, and at that time, uh, Command & Conquer had been out for a while and there were a whole bunch of Command & Conquer clones coming out, games like Kill, Crush and Destroy. Uh, and they were selling really well. And we looked at those and thought, those are really easy. We, we could do one of those really quickly, right? We'll just keep doing the monkey thing. Um, but in the short term, we'll do a quick and easy Command & Conquer clone. Uh, and and, um, and that'll, you know, that, that, that'd be a nice, quick, easy project for us to do. So we set off down that route. Um, so yes, originally um, Shogun wasn't intended to be a, uh, no, a, a groundbreaking um, strategy game which, which goes in to places no one had ever gone before. It was intended to be a kind of B-quality Command & Conquer clone. Um, but we started off doing some mock-ups with flocking. Uh, we had this idea that, okay, let's instead of having lots of uh, having a small number of units, tanks and so on, we'll have lots of tiny little ant-like ant people with the top-down view still and, and do some interesting things with flocking to make that happen. Uh, we did some mock-ups and that looked quite cool. Um, but at about the same time, uh, the, the first 3D card came out for PC and the, um, and the idea of suddenly bringing the viewpoint down to the ground and looking out across the landscape with rolling hills uh, and putting the player into, into the battlefield, that became a possibility. And again, we, we, had, a, we had a programmer, he did some clever maths which took it from looking impossible to suddenly, suddenly be, being possible to do these spline-based curved landscapes. Um, and we found ourselves in new territory at that point, and, and from that, Shogun evolved. So the Shogun team was quite small, there were probably about 15 of us at the beginning, maybe 20, 25 by the time we finished. And uh, the success of that project changed, changed everything for the studio. It, it meant 
it meant that as well as having the kind of bread and butter sports products that the other team were doing and, and continued to do, um, we now had our own little uh, own little franchise to build. So we, we set we set to doing that um, really with two strands. We, we, we decided that, that rather than do, an, uh, do a straight clone of the original game with different content or, or, or a 1.5 version, um, we needed to we needed to be the people who beat our own game. So at the same time as as doing the sequel to Shogun, which turned into Medi Medieval, um, we started work on on the game that was going to come after that, with the idea that it was going to be a long project, maybe three or four years, um, but that would be truly revolutionary. And we started work on on Rome at the same time as we started on Medieval. So when we were thinking about what project to do immediately after Shogun. Um, um, we'd basically got the whole of history and the whole of the whole of the world to choose from. Um, so we were we were looking for three things, um, and they're the same three things we look for whenever we start a new Total War game. Um, we want uh, a, a period in time where um, there are lots of small factions at the beginning vying for control over an area of the world where any of them in, any of them could have won, but in real history one of them did in a fairly big way. Um, we're also looking for a period where um, where there's cool content, where there are things that are, are iconic, the, uh, knights in shining armor uh, would be a good, ex a good example of that. Like, you know, the kind of the kind of territory that Hollywood tends to explore, right? Um, so that it's, so that it fits with popular culture and, and will be a, you know, something that people are interested in. And the third thing we're looking for is a period in time when there's when there's technological change, um, and that drives the whole of the tech tree because it, it, you know it is it is a it is a, a big part of the game is the, is the empire building part of it and that needs some kind of change of technology to drive you along so that by the end of the game you're building something different to what you were building at the start of the game. Um, and we looked across all of history and, and, and in the end um, um, we chose medieval period uh, in Europe um, for the game to follow Shogun um, and that's because it satisfied all of, those, all of those criteria probably better than anything else we could think of of the time um, and it's what we wanted to do. I mean I, I think that's that's an important thing, that you know, the team really decides what it wants to do next. So if, if you've played some of the more recent Total War games but haven't played original Shogun or, or Medieval, um, they're quite interesting games to go back to. The, 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 there's one really quite big difference between, between those two games and all the later ones, and that's that the, the campaign map is region-based rather than, rather than tile-based. So, so it's a bit more like um, like the board game Risk, where where you have a region, your, your army sits in that region, you move it to another region. So you're invading from region to region, and that changes the gameplay in quite a big way. Uh, in some respects, it's it's quite a lot simpler, um, but that doesn't make it easier. And, you know, there's still a lot of depth to it, and um, and um, you know, the AI opponents can give you a really quite hard game. Um, so it's it's you know, I, I, I have a soft spot for those two games. I, I think medieval, medieval in particular is probably one of my favourites in terms of the kind of the kind of game that you get out of it. It's very different from the later games, but but you know, very interesting as well. If there's one thing I could do differently uh, um, throughout the Total War games, it would be to not make any mistakes. Uh, I don't know how you do that, um, but. Um, you know, we've always we've always been very ambitious with each, with each of the games. We don't want to make the same game as last time. We don't want to just just reskin stuff and serve it up again. Um, so we're quite we're quite ambitious about pushing things forward, um, um, you know, and, and we're always pushing up the, you know, up against the limit of what we can achieve within within the amount of time and the, the amount of people that we've got here and all the other constraints. Um, and occasionally, occasionally we make mistakes because we're doing that. It's it's slightly risky. Um, and yes, I'd love I'd love to never make any of those mistakes. So all the games come out perfect, you know, perfect on day one. Um, that would be awesome. Um, but um, don't think that's going to happen. And I still think I'd rather I'd rather be ambitious and occasionally occasionally trip up than than just produce the same game over and over again. Thank you, Mr. Mike Simpson. Thank you indeed. And speaking of anniversaries, we've got 200 years of the Battle of Waterloo coming up in Belgium, I think. And we're going to be participating in a small way. Thousands of people from all over the world are going to be too. Um, stay tuned to our social media, our Facebook and our Twitter to find out exactly how. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. It's been 200 years. Seems like yesterday. Yes. You were playing Napoleon Total War yesterday, that's why. That explains it. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about the podcast. 
the podcast. Well, we've got an exclusive announcement on the next episode of the podcast, and that will be the next real C that you're getting for Total War Tiller. Which, so, which comes out at the same time as The Last Ronin. Excellent, absolutely. Mind blown. Mind blown. Subscribe to that on iTunes, please. And next month, we're going to be talking all about Warhammer, Total War Warhammer on Rally Point. Um, so hop on your demigriffs, because stuff's getting real, or should I say, fantasy. fantasy. Until next time. See you soon. Don't forget. See you soon. The brutal, unthinking bloodlust of the Greenskins. The twisted ambitions of the undead. Ah!